Hey folks, Nathan here. This time we take another of our relatively rare looks at a game that's not Star Wars, but also not from Kickstarter. This is a game that is from Renegade Game Studios. It is the first entry in their Solo Hero series, so it is a solo game, and we'll find that it is based on dice rolling and based on a time mechanic uh, similar to what we see with Fuse and Flatline, which are also games put out by Renegade in a similar vein, but which have a solo mode while not necessarily being solo games specifically. This one is specifically designed for solo play uh, and will be something that is getting more entries in the series later on. It's a $30 game, so let's take a look at what you get. The game back gives us a good sense of what it is that we're dealing with. So we have our setup here. Uh, Maya Strongheart stands alone against the world. A cabal of conspirators has framed her for the death of her own mother, the Sun Queen, and they intend to usurp the throne from her family. To prove her own innocence and reclaim her birthright, Maya must step into the proving grounds to complete a trial that will stretch her combat skills to the limit. Will the Wizen's chosen daughter vanquish her foes in the arena? Or will she be overwhelmed by the conspirators and their evil aspirations? It is again noted it is a one-player game, it takes about 30 to 45 minutes, and it is for ages 10 and up. Now aside from a little winter catalog for Renegade's Game Studios, or you know whatever season the most recent version has been packaged in, this is the first printing, uh, you also have two books in there. One is the rule book, telling you how to play the actual game. The other essentially designed to set the stage. Uh, it's a little... I don't know if you call it a novella or a short story, uh, but a prose fiction story called Proving Grounds. It says, uh, only the strongest has the heart of a wizened queen. It's written by Monica Valentinelli. And basically, it's a prose version, kind of, of the game. It tells the story of this society. It tells who the different uh, players are in terms of their places within the society, within the leadership, within the nobility, uh, how this trial by combat works, etc., etc. But, unlike what you would see in many games, where it's designed to sort of set the stage for what's about to happen, and then you play the game, and your gameplay is how the story is supposed to play out in your mind, it actually does continue forward through what would essentially be the actions of the game, doing so in kind of a I want to say a rudimentary manner. Rudimentary is not the right word, but sort of an abbreviated manner so that it doesn't seem like it's nearly as difficult as the game itself makes it out to be uh, in order to bring it to a conclusion. So you can actually look at it as a story in and of itself without needing the game component. It reminds me in a lot of ways if you're a fan of Star Wars books and remember the early Episode One Adventures and Star Wars Adventures games, whereas Star Wars Missions had a game where it was essentially a game built into one book. What they did with Episode One Adventures and Star Wars Adventures was very much like this, where you had a storybook you could just read on your own and just get the story and never touch the game components. There was a point at which part of the story overlapped with the game, and if you wanted to, you could jump out of that book and play the game using the separate smaller book that came with it. It's kind of the approach here. Here's a complete story if you just want to read the fiction. But a big chunk of this near the end is the trial by combat, which is the entire point of the game Proving Grounds if you want to play that. Do you need to understand this to understand the game? No. Does this give you some better context for the game? Yes, but I felt like they could have done more with less, perhaps. Give us some cool background in the rule book that helps lead us from section to section, from scenario type to scenario type without necessarily telling us a story that basically tells us what the, you know, to go back to the sci-fi fan, what the canonical version of events would be, because now it kind of feels weird when you're playing it, because you're playing it isn't going to play out exactly like the story itself does. In any event, though, it is cool that they gave us the prose story. It's just interesting and odd that it was done as a separate item within the game, rather than being sort of interwoven with the game itself. Now, to actually play the game, you're going to have the encounter board. Okay, It basically is going to fit together like a puzzle. It is identical on either side, so use whichever side makes the most sense for you. Quick, snap together, easy to use. You have 15 dice that are included. You have basically eight regular attack dice, which are these white ones here. 
you then have two each of green, yellow, and blue. And then you do have an extra one that's a little bit odd that instead of having numbers, has symbols on it that we'll look at momentarily called the Dragonling die. This is just used for one specific scenario. Now explaining the various components and what they do really makes the most sense if we actually look at the way the game is set up initially. You start with five of your regular attack dice. You also start with one each of the three colored dice for a total of eight with three color variations in there as well. The other three colored dice get stacked over here. This is your health track. You're gonna start here, injured, 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 dead, right? Not a lot of health in this game. It's a fairly fast moving game. But you may notice that this one here has this weird ring around it where you've got multiple colors. That's because you essentially stack these on this spot. And when your health eventually does reach that point, you get to take one of those dice. And then the two remaining ones move down to the next spot of the health track. And when you take another hit, you get to take another of those dice. But then if you take another hit, you're dead, right? So you're never going to actually wind up typically having all three of these sort of bonus dice that you can get later on uh, based on your desperation as you're being injured. So you have to be careful of which ones you actually need in the context of where you are in the game. You are tracking your health. So you have a little heart health token, a little wooden one here. The other three white attack dice are over here on what's called the exhaustion track. The last part of your regular round or your turn, whatever you want to call it, the last part of your round, you're going to basically advance these one slot downward of those three. And once one of them goes off the track, it goes into your dice pool. So you have three other ones here that could wind up very quickly going into your dice pool. And when you take a hit, you are forced to take one of your dice and place it onto the top spot there of the exhaustion track. And as they move, whether it's a couple of them stacked up like over here or just one at a time, as they move, as soon as a stack or one moves off of it, it goes back into your dice pool. So essentially a wound is debilitating because it takes one of your dice away, but it's not necessarily something you can't come back from because you are able to essentially recover if you survive from round to round. Now they call the basic game without any extra modules added to it, and the game does come with quite a few. They call that the training game. And in the training game, your goal is essentially what you'll see in the other ones without a lot of complications, and that is that you are facing these conspirators who are up against Maya there in trial by combat, and you have 30 enemy cards. And these enemy cards are being drawn and placed in six spots around this oddly shaped but now intelligently shaped encounter board here. They'll have their health marked by these so-called battle markers. There are six of these little wooden tokens, and they're always going to start in the little slot on one of these cards that's marked with a little bracket. Your goal is to eventually defeat a total of eight enemies. So as you defeat one of these, they'll be removed and replaced by another one coming off of a deck from that total of 30. Now, one thing I would note here before we go into anything else is that they kind of made a mistake in the original print run. And you'll know it's the original print run because the little uh, number of the product above the barcode on the back of the box ends in a dash zero one. That is a first printing. All of the first printing enemy cards has their bracket in this little empty box below any ones that have numbers or dice colors noted in them and above the one that notes you getting a wound, which is what this is here, okay? Whereas what they meant to do was to actually move that bracket upward one space and, you know, in an outlier case, two spaces and some other outlier cases not moving it at all, but in most cases, moving it up one space, which makes the game significantly easier. 
but that updated deck isn't what actually went to the printers. So the first printing has essentially a hard mode deck as its enemy deck. So if you have the first printing, make sure you go onto the website for Renegade Games, look up their information about this, and just contact them, and they will send you for free the actual corrected regular mode, which those who played initially think of now sort of as easy mode version of the enemy deck. It's just 30 cards with slightly different positioning. We'll talk about that specifically at the end for those who are super curious and anal retentive like I am. Uh, as far as future printings, they're going to include the corrected one, not the original one. So if you basically want an easy and hard version of the enemy deck, make sure the version that you find is the first printing. Again, a dash zero one above the barcode on the back of the box. Be careful if you wanna get the one and then ask them for the other and have it sent to you. So you've got essentially an expanded game even more. Now the idea is that the game works by dice sets, okay? So you'll have one minute on a timer and you will roll all your dice. And when you roll them, you will then very quickly, because you only have one minute, sort them out by number. So for instance, all the fives get sorted together, all the ones, all the threes, and so on. What you're trying to do is build up sets of more than one of a particular number. And when the time runs out, you are going to assign those to whichever enemy is at that number. So let's say you have, you roll all your dice and you had three ones. Those three ones are going to be a set that is assigned to the enemy at the spot marked one. Your set of twos would go on the two and so on and so on. But if you ever run into a situation, except for one particular enemy, where you have a single where it's just one die that has that number and none of the other dice you rolled has that number, that, if it gets assigned to an enemy, is going to mean that they're able to hit you, okay? It still has to be assigned, but it's the bad version of the result, essentially. Now, as you're rolling, you can always re-roll a set, but never a single. So let's say I had results of, uh, let's say three, one, and one here as an example. I could re-roll the ones. I could not re-roll the three. But if I re-roll the ones, maybe I'll have a three among them, and all of a sudden there's a set of threes, and I could re-roll that set of threes. Uh, you're essentially always able to re-roll sets, never able to re-roll singles. And you're trying to avoid singles as much as possible. But there's more strategy to it than that. Because not only are you trying to you know, get sets in the first place to assign to these enemies, you have to keep track of their requirements. This is an example here of just a standard enemy card. For now, we'll ignore this dragonling symbol up here. We'll look at that with one of the little modules, but they all have this battle track going on here. And you have a start space, which again, depending on which deck you're using, might be up one, maybe up two, but usually up one for the reprint set, uh, the original set for the first printing that was in error has it on the blank spot, either way. And if you look up, you see these numbers and sometimes a little colored box there. What this is telling you is that you start here. If you get a set of at least three dice with whatever his number happens to be based on his position, you get to move the little tracker from here to here. And in this case, it's three again from here to here and so on and so on. And you can have it happen all at once. Like let's say I had six dice that all happened to be of this guy's number. That could be three used for this movement and three used for this movement. Sometimes you run into a situation where it's got a marker that tells you, oh, oh wait a second, you only gotta have two dice in a set to hit this guy for this last one, but one of them's gotta be green, for example. Or it might show uh, two colors and a slash and it can be one or the other. But if you move it all the way up to the top of the track, boom they're dead. However, every time you put a single on a card, that's going to wind up moving it backwards down the track, essentially. And if you're already at this space and it moves it backwards, you take a hit. But then once you take that hit, then it resets that little marker to that starting space again. Most of the enemies, but not all, also have some type of special ability. Like in this case, if you assign a single to this enemy, so you've rolled all your dice and you only had one die 
that had the number of his spot, like say he was at the bottom, so maybe he's in spot number four. If you assign a single to this enemy, instead of dropping down one spot on the battle track, you drop down two, right? Uh, just based on his ability. Some of them have other abilities like, you know, uh, if you have a set of a certain color, it counts as two or whatever. So there is some variability in terms of the enemies and the strategy that goes with them. But it's this frantic, one minute at a time, constant rolling and re-rolling and re-rolling and re-rolling. Always re-rolling sets when you feel like you need to, but never re-rolling singles, uh, just using sets to try to hopefully have something match the single on the re-roll, and then assigning them out, moving the battle markers up to hopefully get to the last spot and take them out eight times, moving them down to take a hit as you track your health over here and you're gaining and moving the dice around to alter your dice pool as you go. Again, you hit the top spot on the battle track for any enemy and they are dead. You do that by meeting the criteria of how many dice of that number you are able to assign based on their slot. If you take a hit, it's because it's gotten to the bottom, you lose one health, on the track, you move one of your dice, whichever one you choose out of your dice pool, onto the exhaustion track, and then you put the little battle marker back to the starting point. But don't worry, you'll eventually get the dice back because once you reach the point where you're at the end of a round, the exhaustion track's gonna move down, you'll take whatever's in the spot that just moved off the track. And if you get hit three times, that third hit gets you to the spot as it snakes around to give you an extra die. The next hit does also, but beware because the next hit will kill you. Um, it's kind of an elegant design. It's fun. It's fast paced. It can be stressful, frankly. There is a bit of strategy involved along with the luck. It's sort of a press your luck type of game. Um, I found that the training mode by itself is really, really fun and great to get people into the game at first. Whether you're doing the hard mode version of the cards, so to speak, from the first printing, or those easier ones they can replace them with. But that's not all the game is. The game actually comes with six other modules that you can plug in, mix and match, swap in, swap out, to alter the gameplay with new mechanics. Some of which are mechanics that typically are beneficial to you, some that make the game significantly harder. The first module uses this little sort of baby dragon called the Dragonling. And to make sure that you remember the rules for it, this little Dragonling token, you kind of sit off to the side, then on the back has a reminder of how it all works. And that is where that other die comes in. This is the Dragonling die. The idea is that her bloodline has a connection to these dragons and this little dragon is going to help her within the fight. So this is sort of a beneficial module most of the time. So you'll notice that these cards, some of them have nothing in the corner, but some have a little circle with a symbol, like I showed you on that card a moment ago. When you roll the Dragonling die, you're rolling it with all your other dice. And anytime you have a set of dice that you want to re-roll, you can include this when you're re-rolling. However, you can't combine this with a single and then re-roll it as if that's a set. That doesn't count. It has to be a pre-existing set and you just toss this in there with it. But the symbols on here are either a talon, tail, or teeth as one set of possible results. Those three allow you to assign a dragonling die as part of a set onto an enemy that has that particular symbol up in the corner. It could be any of those three, but some of them, like I said, many of these have actually in our example here don't have the symbols, so you can't really do it. You could also wind up with the wing, okay? The wing basically is protective, essentially. Uh, if there is one instance, at least, where you're about to get hit because somebody's dropped down to that red spot because you had a single, that wing essentially jumps out and protects you from taking that hit so you don't actually suffer that wound. Two of the faces, though, are this symbol, which is chaos, okay? If when the time limit is up, okay, when either you stop rolling within your minute and just let the time expire, or when the time actually expires after one minute, if you still have this chaos symbol showing, that means that before you can resolve any attacks, right, and set everything out uh, to figure out who's 
got what sets and that sort of thing to figure out which of your enemies are going after you or you're going after them and so on and so on. You must re-roll every single colored die that you have, which may break up some of your sets and just change the configuration of what you thought you had before time ran out. So in that sense, it can be a detriment, but for the most part, as long as you're avoiding the chaos result, the other ones are pretty much all beneficial to you from the Dragon League. The second module is the Chariot module, which has 19 Chariot cards, which are basically guys on chariots who are basically zipping around the arena trying to take you out while you're already dealing with these other six jerkweeds to try to, you know, take out the eight that you need. Essentially, as you're playing, you have one of these sitting out okay, uh, near your board, and as you are rolling and rolling and rolling and rolling, during that one-minute time limit, each of these will have some type of effect that could hit you if you haven't met a dice requirement when the timer has run out. So to meet that requirement, you might have one of these that has a specific die listed with a specific result, uh, the color doesn't matter, it's just a question of the number. Or you might have some that have two side by side with question marks with an equal sign in between. Essentially, what that means is that while you're rolling and rolling and rolling, you need to put one die on here with whatever number is required, or in the case of one of these, two dice on it with equal numbers showing on their faces to keep that chariot from attacking when the time limit runs out. If they attack, it's just that ability activating. Whether it's activated or not, you discard that chariot at the end of that particular round. However, after you've moved the exhaustion track, again, which is those dice over here that just move successively downward, once you advance the exhaustion track, you wind up pulling out another one for the next round. And if the exhaustion track is empty, there's no dice in it anymore, either the original three or ones that you've perhaps added to it because you took some hits, then congratulations. After revealing one, you're also revealing a second one. So the further along you are in the game, based on your exhaustion track, and the better off you're doing, the sooner you'll see a second chariot added to the first to try to take you out that you're having to deal with as you're going through and also trying to come up with your sets to go after the individual enemies. So chariots definitely makes for a tougher experience. Module three is another beneficial one. Inspiration powers. You have 15 of these cards. And before you start, you figure out which modules you're using. They each have a symbol to tell you which module it happens to be, like say Dragonling in this case. And you make sure that the ones that are available either have nothing marked or they have one of the modules that you actually have in play, and you've removed any ones for modules that are not being used at that time because it just wouldn't work with the game. Okay. You shuffle them, you draw one for yourself, and whatever it is, that is an ongoing ability that stays in play for you for the entire game that gives you some benefit, such as when you add a die to the exhaustion track, immediately move it down one space, which cycles your exhaustion track faster and gets you your dice back more quickly. Or, all colored dice can be treated as any color. You may not use the wing result of the Dragonling die, right? So you can use all colored dice as any color, which is a great benefit, but that wing on the Dragonling dice, since you have to be playing with the Dragonling module to be able to use this particular card as one of the ones you could draw, that one that could protect you from taking a hit can't be used, so there is a drawback. But cool ongoing abilities, predominantly beneficial to you. The fourth module is shields, and it's pretty rough. You have six of these little shield tokens that you wind up placing on the individual enemies. And the way this works in the shields mode is if you are going to attack an enemy, but you attack them with the wrong combination, right? Meaning that, yeah, you've rolled all your dice and you've come up with a set for that enemy, and you've assigned it to that enemy by placing it wherever it's supposed to go, but it turns out that while it is a set, it doesn't meet the criteria to actually hit them and move them along the battle track, they then raise their shield as a result. So not only do they not take a hit, they raise their shield, you put the shield token 
onto the individual card, as in that case there. Then, for all the upcoming rounds, every time you attack them with a set, not only does it not hurt them, it moves them down the battle track. They get better off and you lose progress against that enemy. Instead, and I know it's counterintuitive because we've been staying away from singles the entire time, you have to roll a single and assign it to that particular enemy. Because a single, rather than being something that moves it down the track, breaks their shield. That's basically why sets will move it down the track instead of a uh, single moving it down the track because they replaced that mechanic so the single breaks the shield so something else would have to move it down the track and that's the sets. Once an enemy does have the shield gone, you know, it's just right back to singles moving it down the track heading towards hurting you and then sets moving it up the track assuming that they match uh, to be able to give you progress against them. But it makes beating any given enemy particularly difficult and no, the shield coming up cannot be something uh, that the Dragonling Dies wing prevents. That's just to prevent you taking a hit. It has no bearing whatsoever on whether or not an enemy raises their shield. It's pretty tough. Module 5 is the Conspirators module with six Conspirators cards. Okay. Each time you wind up defeating an enemy, you wind up flipping face up out of the Conspirator deck one of the Conspirator cards. Notice that each one has some type of ability listed and some numerical die result underneath. While one of these is face up, before you begin a round, the first thing that you do is you roll a die. Just one of your white attack die. And if the number comes up for that particular conspirator, its ability takes effect for that round. And every time you defeat another enemy through the first six, because there's only six conspirators, another one comes out, and another, and so on. And there's one for each possible die result, right? One through six. So the more enemies you defeat, the more conspirators are out there, the more likely it is you're triggering something detrimental to you with that initial roll before the round really gets going. Now, the last module is called Sun and Moon. I've kind of changed our configuration here to make it easier to see what we're going to do with this. Normally, we would have our three extra colored dice stacked up on that spot on the health track there, right? The one representing taking three hits, as I've mentioned previously. But we're actually going to change up what the encounter board looks like. We have this thing called the Sun and Moon dial. Right? It's got spots for three dice, it'll be them, a spot marked as sun that's in front of her, a spot marked moon, which is behind her, and it's got a little plastic rivet thing in here. What we do is we're going to make use of that little hole that we've had all along in our encounter board. Okay, we're going to place our rivet, stick that on there, hold it in place while it is able to turn, and we are good to go. We're going to place our three colored dice there on those slots. And every single round at the beginning, Maya is able to turn. She rotates the dial so that the direction she's facing matters. So let's turn it right here like this, okay, as an example. The way that this winds up working is that all the ones kind of off to her sides, the four that aren't in sun or moon position, you know, they just work as normal, no big deal. But you wind up with bonuses and things that are detrimental to you depending on what happens to the people who are in the sun or moon position. And bear in mind, you can't stay in the same position round to round. You can always come back to it, but every time a new round begins, you must rotate the dial to a new position. So you can't stay in the same place twice, but you could rotate it back after skipping a turn by pointing it somewhere else. Now, let's say you score a successful hit on an enemy in your sun position. If you do, you are allowed to take one of those three dice and add it to your dice pool for the next round. Just temporarily, then it goes right back. 
However, if you don't wind up scoring a hit, you don't get that benefit. Nothing else bad happens to you, but you don't get that benefit. On the other hand, for the enemy in the moon position who could be attacking you from behind, if you score a hit on them, eh, nothing happens. You've just fended them off, so to speak, from your you know, disadvantageous direction. But if you wind up not scoring a hit on them, that essentially allows them to get to you, and you move the little marker one spot down the battle track for that enemy. This also makes it particularly difficult. I think it's kind of one of these where I'm not sure whether this or shields is the toughest of the modules, but they can both be pretty rough. So it's a pretty adaptable game to whatever type of experience you're wanting to have at the moment. You can just do the regular training mode uh, with either the original deck or the replacement deck. If you got the first printing, you could wind up adding some modules to help you. You could add some modules to hurt you, add them all, mix and match. Really, your choice. It's kind of interesting because it felt like in a lot of ways when playing the game that it's kind of like we were playing the regular game and playing expansion content that many games would have added later all in the same box, which was nice giving some decent value to that 30 bucks that you're spending. Now, I would also note here, speaking of rules, before we move to differences in the two different sets of cards, uh, the enemy cards, that there is also a reference card that gives you your round sequence on one side and reminders about the modules on the other, uh, just to make sure that you're remembering what to do if there's not already a reminder, for instance, on the Dragon Ling token. Now let's take a look at those two different enemy decks. The original first printing one that actually turned out to be sort of like a hard mode and the one that is meant to be in it that will be in there after the second printing that those who got the first printing can contact them and get for free. Again, it comes back to these enemy decks here, 30 cards. Now, the easiest way to go through these rather than doing them side by side, which would really take kind of forever in an already long video, is to remember that for the original printing, the hard mode stuff, the ones that weren't meant to be in the box. Your starting point on your battle track is always right here. It is always between the ones with the actual number requirements and right above the one that will cause you an injury. Okay, it cause you to take a hit. It's always going to be that blank space. In the case of the replacement cards, the ones for second printing and onward, the easier ones it's gonna start usually a little bit above. That's what we can use to differentiate them. All right, so there are six different enemies. You have five different versions of each. Uh, they all have the same art. Kind of would have been nice if it was changed up a little bit, but whatever. Okay, so Warrior in Training. Notice that starting point there. All five of Warrior in Training remain unchanged between the two decks, okay? For Sun Queen Representative, you have two unchanged, three that are, only by going up one spot. For Queen's Bodyguard, all five have moved up one space. So one, two, three, four, five. For Moon Queen Representative, moved, 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 not moved. So four moved, one not. For Clan Elder, we actually start with kind of an odd one. This one not only moved up one space, but two for this particular one, okay? And then you've got one that moved up one, moved up one, stayed the same, stayed the same. So Clan Elder is the one that is the oddball of the group. Two stayed the same, two moved up one space, one moved up two spaces. And then Bradenite Guard, you've got one, two, three, four that changed, one that did not. So all in all, between the two decks, you have 11 cards that are unchanged. It's going to be exactly the same no matter which of the two decks you're playing with, but the other 19 have all had at least the starting point moved up one space with one of those 19 cards moving it up two spaces. So there you have it. All the contents of the physical copy of Proving Grounds. And I say physical copy because I should note that there is an app. It's not an app version of the game, but an app you can use with the game. It reminds you about the setup for all the different modules. It keeps track of your scores, if you like, and it has a built-in timer with some tense music and sound effects to go with it. It's free, but just search for it by using Renegade Games in the App Store rather than searching by the name Proving Grounds because it is used for multiple games. You select which game you're playing to start with. It also includes ones for things like Fuse. So 
with that, uh, we'll wrap this up. I definitely look forward to more in these Solo Hero series, and I'm really glad that I dropped the cash, the 30 bucks, actually probably a little bit less at Miniature Market at the time, uh, to pick up Proving Grounds. We probably could have done without the novella that was such a big deal in the advertising, but the gameplay is really fun, really tense, and it's a really fast game to play.